they meant their skit to be funny. I was trying to do something very serious. <laughs> I, love, uh, I love the series we're in, the verse that changed everything. What I like about what's happening is we're hearing a lot of different people, and it's really just been stories, hasn't it? It's been people telling their stories about how they encounter God and how God's really changing them. And I love that because the Bible's a story. The Bible was not given to us as a theology textbook. It wasn't given to us as an operations manual of how to live the Christian life. It was a story. It's God's story. And in God's story, people show up and they have good experiences and bad experiences. And then that most important person, Jesus, shows up and gives us our redemptive hope. So my, my story begins in a small farm town in central Illinois, about 50 miles south of Peoria. I have a lot of great memories of my home growing up, a lot of great memories of this little town that I grew up in. My mom and dad each came from large families in this community and Mary, they'd lived there their whole lives. And so tons of family and connections in this town. They married, started their lives together. My dad was in the lab and plastering business and, uh, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. Mom would later describe those early years of marriage as the happiest years of her life. I joined my older brother and sister, so there were three of us, and my mom and dad just started this kind of picture-perfect family in this little farm town in central Illinois. And I have no memories, no personal memories of what would become the most defining event in my childhood and in many ways in my whole life. My dad was diagnosed with cancer when I was a baby, and he died when I was three years old. I don't have any real memories of my father. All that I know of him comes mostly through stories that I've heard or pictures that I've heard over the years <clears throat> and things I've heard from family. He's a strong man, very gentle, loved cars, loved his family, loved hunting, was always ready to help people. So while I don't know the impact of losing him, I don't remember the I don't memories of him, I do have very real memories of the impact of losing him, of what the fallout is of growing up without a dad. I remember as a little boy, I remember I was three when he died, so even in my earlier years growing up, I, I, I just pictures in my mind of things like my mom sitting out in the backyard under a tree crying for hours, and I, I remember being puzzled by that as a little boy. Now I understand it's probably just trying to sort through how, how to be a mom of uh, three little kids in a, in a, in a community where you, she was expecting my dad to be able to provide. But I remember watching that. I remember also seeing and experiencing the grief of, and the struggles that my older si siblings, my brother and sister had. They were older. They knew a little bit more of my father from their personal experience than I did and watched as they wrestled through this reality we didn't talk a lot about my dad's death uh, and, or his illness. And I, I can honestly say, I don't know if that was because nobody would talk about them or because I just didn't ask. I, I'm not real sure. It could be a little bit of both. Um, but I had questions and I carried them, but I, I just felt like everyone was so overwhelmed with everything that I just kind of sunk in the background and those questions and wanting to know more, just kind of sunk into the background. So I reacted, we all react to situations and, and loss in different ways. I reacted by becoming a good kid. Uh, I became the consummate people pleaser, the one who uh, always wanted people to like and accept me. <clears throat> I didn't find out till later, you know, where that came from, from a, a deep fear of shame and abandonment in my life of not wanting people to leave me, but I, I would be whoever you needed me to be because we wanted, uh, I needed people to, to stay together. I didn't want to lose anybody. But overall, I, I lost myself in what others needed me to be, and that's kind of how I coped with that in my, my life and family. My mom, who had a very difficult childhood herself, loved the Lord, leaned on him for strength throughout her life. She came from a, a lot of trouble in her own family, alcoholic father, um, stepfather, her father had died when she was a little girl. Um, but it was during my dad's illness that my dad came to faith in Christ and many of his siblings, he was from a family of nine, came to faith in Christ. And so after my father died, my mom poured herself into this little country church. 
Uh, and by pouring, we were there every time the doors were open. We were Sunday morning, Sunday school, and then church, and Sunday night church, and Wednesday night Bible study, and youth group. And if they had a missions conference, you were there every night. And if you had Holy Week services, you were there every night. Every time the doors were open, we were there. And it wasn't just activity. My mom truly was leaning into the Lord. We would regularly see her Bible open and she'd be reading it and studying it and wanting to know more about God and how he could help us in this situation. And ours was a a stereotypical small town country church. It had all the maladies and problems of a little country church. If you grew up in a little country church, you know sometimes it can be run by one or two families and they kind of keep things going. So it had all of those problems, but it also did what country little bitty rural churches do well, sometimes better than churches like ours, and that's just they love really well. They do, they do family. They connect naturally, uh, and so that was my church growing up. I was never left out of any father-son events. In fact, if they would announce a father-son event, a camping trip or a fishing trip or something that, that you're supposed to do with your sons, I would always have at least four or five invitations from other men in the church to come and be with them as their son for the trip. So I always, always felt like I belonged. I specifically remember, I think it was around fourth grade, third or fourth grade, my mom got a call from one of the men at the church because, and he basically asked my mom, has anyone, remember this is a small rural town, has anyone taught John how to shoot a rifle yet? because that's kind of a rite of passage in a small town. You know, you're not really gonna grow up to be a man if you don't know how to shoot a rifle. So he, so he, so this guy just came and picked me up and we went out in the woods and spent the day shooting and talking about life and talking about God and what it means to grow up to be a man. And then I, I so I witnessed the church at its best in many ways as it supported my, our family. We were kind of the poor widow family in this town one of them, and uh, I not only heard of God's love, but I saw it in action from the people in my church. They did really, really well at doing that. Um, I remember, for example, one of our youth group leaders one time when I was a teenager, and by youth group leaders, if you've been down this path, no one's paid to do this. It's all volunteers. There's just a, a couple of volunteer youth group leaders, but they had an idea that they would link a teenager with an adult as a prayer partner kind of thing, and the the adult was going to commit to praying every day for the teenager. And, and it was just kind of a big thing. It happened and never really followed up much on it. But here, here's kind of what happens in my own church, in my hometown. Marilyn got my name. I was back in my hometown a couple years ago <clears throat> and talked to Marilyn. And she assured me that 40 years later, she still prays every day for me because she got that card when I was a teenager. I was, what a commitment, what a desire to make a life change. How many, how many times in my life was it maybe Marilyn's prayer that, that helped me or taught me or kept me uh, out, out of messes? But that, that was the church that I grew up in. They loved really pouring into relationships. But the, I still, so I was, I was seeing all this wonderful stuff in the church, so still wrestling with shame and fear and, and confusion uh, of what it means growing up without a dad. Uh, I still, a good example of of the shame that I felt, I remember vividly when I was at Cub Scouts and they were passing out the Pinewood Derby cars. Remember the little Pinewood Derby blocks of wood and you're supposed to take them home, carve it into a, a car. And I remember getting that and seeing all the other kids in my den of my Cub Scout group really excited and all I could think about was, we don't have any tools, any tools in my house. And, and I, I took that block of wood home and my mom and I literally went to the kitchen and got like a kitchen knife out to see if we could do something to make it look like a car. And then we both got frustrated and she called one of the guys from church and he came and picked me up and we went to his home where he had a nice wood shop and helped me to make this car. So he helped me with the project, but he couldn't help with the shame. He couldn't help with that, wow. Who am I? I mean, where, where am I gonna fit here? He couldn't remedy that. So seeing, seeing the church at its best and in contrast to this just kind of emptiness and wandering through life and trying to figure out where this goes, uh, was, was in our church, we always had missionaries that would come to our church and we had big missions conferences and I would hear their stories 
of what happened in their, in their ministries and how lives were transformed. And, and, and it really captured my heart. So I went and talked to my pastor one day. I was probably a freshman or a sophomore maybe in high school. And I, I just shared with my pastor, I thought, I just feel like I want to be a pastor or a missionary. And I, I don't know what to do next. And, and he's very encouraging. And he said, well, you probably should preach sometime. And this, another thing about my little church was, and, and church, maybe 100 people a week in this church, um, anytime any kid in our church had something uh, that they were doing, they were put up front. So if you were, it was not uncommon if a fourth grader was taking piano lessons for them to like do special music on a Sunday morning. And, and they would come down and the church would make them feel like they were the best piano player on the face of the earth that day. And, and this church knew how to pour into kids. And, and I don't know about you, I miss that. I mean, there's a lot of stuff about small church life that I don't miss, but that it's hard to do that when we need all this, right? But the, we still need to grasp that. And I know some of our, our kid connection ministry, and we wanna, you know, where we find that and celebrate that, that kid taking piano lessons needs to know how to use that gift for the Lord. And uh, my church loved that. They gave, even gave a scholarship to every kid who would go to college, every high school kid that would go to college, it was $1,000 from this, the income from a farm that they had, $1,000. That mattered for college back then, you know, when I was a kid. Now, I think $1,000 is the fee that you pay to cover all the fees that they have for you to get into college. But, but back then, $1,000 helped if you were trying to go, to go to college. So, so that's what my pastor said. Well, you, you probably need to preach. So we started talking, and he wanted to know what passage I wanted to, to preach on. And this is the passage that I chose and preached on when I was a sophomore in high school in my little country church. Uh, 1 John chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is the love of God, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it who overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And that phrase in verse four is what really captured my attention. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. As a kid who grew up without a dad, not knowing where that connection was, everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that's overcome the world even our faith. So I worked on my message. I stood up in front of my church. I gave it the best 15 minutes I had, and I was like, done. And that was, uh, and I came down, and it, you would have thought Billy Graham just stepped off the stage. That church was so encouraging. Um, but, but the truth of that verse carried well beyond that inaugural sermon. It was, there's a victory that overcomes the world. It's your faith. After high school, went to Bible college, uh, trained in pastoral ministries, Bible, met my wife, Sarah. We were married after college, began pastoring in a small country church not far from where we grew up. And as often happens, if, if you have trauma or loss as a kid, you learn how to cope and you learn how to do things and you survive and you develop some muscles in certain areas to be able to get through. And they serve you well as a kid, maybe as a teenager, but then you grow up and you get married and you start doing life with others. And those things that you, that were really helpful for you as a kid are all of a sudden are getting in the way. And that's what was happening for me. That people pleasing that I had, um, wanting people to like me, interfered with my marriage, interfered with ministry. It showed up in undeniable ways all the time. But I was still, still living out of that people-pleasing mindset. I remember in that little country church we pastored in Washington, Illinois, I remember the first time, for example, someone came up to me and they said they were leaving the church. And I'm like, well, why? And they said, because we don't like you. And I'm like, no, anything but that, anything but that. Just don't let it be me. And, and, and it was just so, I remember that. I was, that was my response because, wow, I can't be rejected. I, I need people to like me because that's where I find my security. That's where I find my value. That's where I find my protection. And then I was launched on a journey, a journey to realize how harmful this was for me and for other people I was in relationship with to be a people pleaser, to depend on other people's opinion of me to give me value and worth and security. 
So as I increased in God's knowledge of God's love and how he's accepted me, I found that my fears of others rejecting me diminished and I began to grow into that. I began to grow. It was a long, hard journey, but I realized my worth and value were not found in what other people thought of me. If they disagreed with me, if they didn't like me, I started actually living into this and kind of liking it, that uh, people cannot like me and it's okay. Uh, my wife did remind me at one point that because I was getting so into this, she said basically, that's not a new life goal for you, you know, to get people to not like you because I was like, I, I, can, I can be okay and not please everybody. And so, uh, but as a kid who grew up without a father, what I was experiencing was the taste of what life is like when you live as a child of God. Because when you live as a child of God, your, your identity is set by what Jesus Christ did for you, not by other people. So our family grew. Sarah and I had, had three kids of our family who we love and are so proud of. Moved here to St. Louis, began pastoring a daughter church of First Free. And, uh, and that was when we experienced another great loss in our family. My brother, who was 40 years old, died of a heart attack in 2000. That was another big blow to my mom. But she clung to her faith, continuing to to walk and exhibit that trust in God through another huge loss in her own life and our lives. And that remained true until her death a few years ago. I remember her decline in health began when she fell and uh, she lived a few months after that, but she fell and hit her head and the doctor said there was some bleeding in her brain and would need to do surgery and she, 80, or 83, I think. She, she was very clear on what she wanted in the end of life, and she said, no, I don't, I don't want that surgery. And the doctors said, well, this first 24 hours is gonna be really, really key to know if you're gonna make it or not. And so I remember praying with my mom that night and talking about it and saying, you know, mom, they said this first 24 hours is really critical if you're gonna, if you're gonna survive. And she assured me she knows and loves Jesus. She's ready to go be with, with the Lord in heaven. So I left her, went to the waiting room and slept came back to see her the next morning, and I'm not exaggerating at all, she was a little bit mad that she was still here. She thought like, this is it, today's the day, I'm gonna be able to go, tomorrow morning I wake up with Jesus, and she was a little bit perturbed that she was still here, and uh, she, she lasted a few more months still walking with the Lord and, and loving him, and uh, after she died, I officiated her funeral, and she was buried next to my dad, who 53 years, prior had died and my mom put her name on the headstone right next to him and so she was the last person buried in that little small town cemetery no one's been buried in there for years it's been closed just waiting for her to come and go in there next to my dad and then that cemetery is closed and they're they're resting there together but she lived out that faith that overcomes the world <clears throat> and that's life that's our stories the bible's filled with stories of men and women who encountered incredible challenges in their lives and came out as winners. The world's thrown this at me, but I'm sure each of us, if we would just have time to tell our stories, and I hope we do this regularly in our groups and places where we're at to tell our stories, the, the world's thrown all kinds of stuff at you. And you have stories, and you have wounds, and you have loss, and you have ways you've tried to cope that ended up getting in the way of you growing into the man and woman that God's called you to be. This is why these verses are so foundational for me and my life and ministry. So I wanna talk about a couple of things. First, I wanna talk about what is the world that faith overcomes? Faith is the victory that's overcome the world. I think we need to look a little bit at what is the world. Kind of complex sometimes in the Bible because the world is such a broad topic. In the Synoptic Gospels, the world is used as, to refer to kind of a, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, kind of a temporary reality as a beginning and an end. Uh, Jesus contrasted this this world with the end of the age. There, there's a time on this world. Paul labels this age, this world that we live in as evil, Galatians 4, 3. And that's the way it was before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic principles of this world. So this age, this world is evil. It's opposed to God. It needs to be redeemed. It needs to be restored, which is the hope of the gospel that we have in Christ. And sometimes the world just means the earth, the planet that we live on, the soil that we live on. And then others, such as in Matthew chapter 24, refer to the inhabited world, to the people of the world. 
And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that the nations will hear it and, the, and then the end will come. So the world is sort of equated with the nations, the people of this world. And I think this is important because we have to understand which kind of world are we opposed to and which are we not opposed to. We're not opposed to the people of the world. They need Jesus. They need to know the love of the Lord. This is every human being. This is, this is what we're gonna hear about next week when Dr. Isla Tassi is here to talk to us about the ministry of Lifeway in Kenya uh, because he's gonna share with us about, about even unreached people groups, people that have yet to hear the gospel in their, in their own language and tongue and culture. And if we don't go to them, if someone doesn't go to them, they never will. That's a world we're not opposed to. We're called to love, care for, reach that world with the gospel. Luke chapter two, verse one refers to the decree to tax the whole world. So there's kind of a political world that's looked at. Mark chapter eight, verse 36, Jesus asks what value is there in gaining the whole world and losing life itself? And so many people invest in the pursuits of this life, but place little value on the things that are eternal. And I wanna pause there because when we think about that, gain the whole world, it's easy to think about the wealth and the prestige and the power and the pleasure. But sometimes gaining the world is the ways that we cope with life, the things that we do to soothe our own souls. That, that is, we're, we're buying into the world's system, not monetary economic system, but maybe emotional economic system or, or spiritual economic system or relational economic system. And we're leaning into that instead of the things that are eternal. In John's gospel, in the first letter of John, more than half of the uses in the Greek uh, term cosmos in the whole New Testament in John's writing. In John chapter eight, verse 12, Jesus claims to be the light of the world. The darkness that dispels this, or the darkness that Christ dispels is, is our sin, kind of the stain of sin on all humanity, the brokenness, the, the carnage, the fallout of, the aftermath of sin as it impacts us. In John chapter one, we find a detailed reinterpretation of the creation account in light of Jesus as the hope of the world, the hope of the world. In John's gospel, we find God's love expressed by sending Jesus into the world that's dominated by pain and brokenness and rebellion and grief and loss. And Jesus came not to condemn the world, but so the world will be saved through him. And John paints this picture of humanity imprisoned by false values and knowledges, false knowledge and empty pursuits. And there's a way in which the, the work of Jesus on the cross forgives is where I go to find the forgiveness of my sin. But it's also where I go to find the acceptance that I didn't have as a, as a kid because I didn't know where I belonged. It's, it's the remedy for shame. It's the remedy for fear. It's the remedy for pride. The, the, the cross is the remedy for everything that's broken in this world. First John sharply contrasts, and if you know First John much at all, it's a black and white kind of book. It's like this and this. There's a lot of contrast in First John. But sharply contrasts this world with the intimate life of a disciple. And James, Second Peter, and First John all use this world cosmos as people who are opposed to God. Not that the person himself or herself, but this system that they bought into and the values that they represent and that they are caught up into are opposed to God. First John chapter two, verses 15 through 17 are very familiar to most of us. Do not love this world or the things it offers you for when you love the world, you do not love the father. You do not have the love of the father in you for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see and pride in the achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. In 1 John 5, chapter 19, we know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. And yet we find hope in 1 John. 1 John chapter 4, verse 14. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. So that's why I think it's important to look at the broad scope of world as it's used in, in the New Testament especially, but in, in the whole Bible. 
Because sometimes we can mistakenly fight against the wrong world. We fight against people instead of against the system, against this evil system and the brokenness and the rebellion of this world system. Our faith overcomes the worldly values and attitudes that are opposed to God. We're not defeated by the brokenness, the pain and disappointment, all the less than satisfying solutions that we try. So question for you, how is the world squeezing in on you today? How has the world squeezed in on you and how is the world squeezing in on you today? Maybe it's relationship, marital conflicts, lack of contentment in life, looking for people or other pursuits to give you ultimate purpose in life and value. Maybe you're full of worry and anxiety over your children who are burdened with physical, developmental, economic problems, or they're just not on a path that you would want them to be on, and it's, it's creating a lot of worry and anxiety. You're losing sight of the Lord. Or the growing secularization of a culture that doesn't, doesn't want to even listen to God. Maybe it's loneliness and disappointment that comes with being a single adult in, a, in what seems to be a society that values couples. Chronic pain, mental illness, physical disability, overwhelming grief, all of these are the kinds of things that, that squeeze in on us. But 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5 describe a faith that overcomes the world. Let's go back and look at verses 4 and 5. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So in this section of 1 John, as in other places, we see faith as a sign and a condition of sonship, of belonging to God, of being a part of God's family. In this verse, John is emphasizing how a believer stands in continuing relationship with God as Father. So you can see why this, this captured my heart as a high school kid. Because, wow, there's a, there's a father who I can know. There's a, there's, a, there's a place where I can be a child and have this connection and this relationship. Verse 4 is the only place in all of John's writings where the, the noun faith is used. The Greek word is pistis. Every other occurrence in his writing is in the verb form, which is to believe. This is the only place where faith is a noun. I think that's really important. This is the victory that overcomes the world, your faith. This is a noun. It's real. It exists. Quite apart from you believing it or not believing it, it is, it is faith that is the victory that overcomes the world. So even using the noun form, though, we, we see behavior, the act of believing. The force here seems to be on acknowledging the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. That's sort of the anchor in our lives as we're going through whatever challenges, whatever brokenness, whatever change needs to happen in our life from some miswiring that, that can find its root way back in our, in our past or in some brokenness or situations that we've done. See, that anchor gives us stability both in mind and spirit, even when the storms are raging. When faith is only a cognitive ascent, to a body of doctrine, then it lacks power and effect, efficacy. It, when faith is only this cognitive ascent, then it doesn't work. We might be impressed by it when we hear each other talk about it, but faith can't just be cognitive ascent to a body of knowledge. But when faith lacks the stability of the truth of faith, then it is, it's not saving faith, it's just drifting aspiration. So we both have to have the experience of believing of faith and the, 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 the object of our faith. And that's important. If the object of our faith is true, then nothing in the world, nothing in this godless culture or spiritual opposition or loss or oppression is going to undermine it. I think this is important because in our day, especially in the evangelical church today in the West, sometimes I get the impression that we feel like if we don't stand up and defend God, he might lose. You know what I mean? That, that's like, wow, he, we really need to get out there and do this, or, or God might be in danger of not winning. It's like, no, that's not at all the story. The gospel has and is prevailing in much darker contexts than the one we're in today. I'm not saying it's not dark. I'm not saying there's not some 
things we need to deal with, but the gospel has and is prevailing in much darker context than we have in St. Louis today. Regardless of the prevailing culture, what it's pushing, where it's going, God is still going to be about rescuing sinners with the hope of Jesus. Listen to 1 John 5, 1 to 3. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves the children too. We know that we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. This is another part of belonging to God's family that's so critical. First of all, it's love. It's kind of what I experienced in that little country church that I grew up in where you just watch out for each other, you care for each other. Now, the downside of that is you can be in everybody's business, and that's not fun, but you you, you care for each other. You're there for each other. You want to love. You want to know what's going on. But it's not a demand or duty. It's It's just kind of a characteristic of who we are to the point that if I read this verse right, if we don't love one another, do we really have authentic faith? Are we really believing if we don't? It's that critical. It's that much of a characteristic of the New Testament church that we love one another because that shows that we love God. And if we lack that, it's valid to ask, okay, are we really loving God? And then obedience in the same way. Loving God means keeping his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. That is so huge for us. Obedience is not a duty. It's a characteristic of a child of God. It's really important to know. Obedience is not a duty. It's a characteristic of a child of God. We get caught up in sin management kind of ways of doing church, don't we? Kind of the, that was one of the things that I grew up in. You manage your sin, manage your behavior. Sin management, and I'm not saying there aren't things in Scripture you should do this or shouldn't do that. When we approach, when we approach obedience as sin management, we miss the heart of the gospel. Because the heart of the gospel is, oh, I could keep living as a people pleaser, but look at all that I would be missing of what Christ has provided for me if I did that. I could give in to this temptation and and satisfy my soul. I could try to soothe my own pain this way, but why would I do that when I've been given all of this through Jesus Christ? That's, That's the gospel way to deal with brokenness and sin. Sin management is stop doing that, start doing this, stop doing that, start doing this, which is really burdensome. And here it says, obedience is not burdensome. Look even at 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And I don't know if you're like me, but I can, I can get the first part. He can forgive me of my sins. I'm off the hook for what I did. And cleanse you from all unrighteousness make you pure. He can, he, can, he can make you holy. There's no unrighteousness in you. Boy, it's harder for me to sit in that. But if I sit in that, then I know, okay, this is who I am as a child of God. Not what I need to do and not do. So as we continue to look at this, this, this is, by the way, What I saw in my mom is modeled for so many people in my church. It's what's kept me going for years in my own life. My wife, Sarah, and I, through our family growing up, parenting, family, marriage issues that we've had, uh, it's God moving in with a real faith into imperfect people, not measuring are we doing it or not doing it, but how are we moving toward it? I talk to people a lot who are troubled because they're caught up in some kind of struggle or challenge or maybe wrestling with sin and and they ask, well, does that mean I'm not having faith? Does that mean I I don't believe? And I'm like, well, you're here asking, so I kind of think you do. Uh, Now, I I hope you can have victory over that, but, but we tend to think if we're struggling, then it's a problem. And what I hear is, boy, if you're struggling, that means we're in the game. And we're gonna be struggling until we have this ultimate victory given to us. So this faith that John writes about, and this is, this is an interesting part of verse four, the translation in verse four in most English translations kind of obscures a Greek wordplay that John puts in here. Uh, in the NIV, for example, the Greek word nikao, which is overcome, 
but then the Greek noun, nike, is victory. But if we want to do a translation of this that kind of tries to keep that word play that, that the Apostle John does, it would sound something like this. Everyone born of God conquers the world, and this is the conquering that's conquered the world, even our faith. Everyone born of God conquers the world, and this is the conquering that's conquered the world, even our faith. John wants to make it very clear to his readers, this is done, guys. The victory is done. It's provided for you as his child. Now, the nature of this victory is not narrowly defined as the victory of Christ once for all on the cross, the victory of believers and the opposition that we face in the church from our culture. It's the victory and the losses, the personal losses that we have in our lives. And despite all of these, the victory is ours. It doesn't mean we avoid the path, but it means we walk the path of grief or pain or temptation or loss or brokenness or hurt relationships, we walk that path as children of God who knowing that the faith has brought us victory. I recently received an email from a woman who I've worked with off and on for several years, helping her to process and find healing through some, for some wounds that she experienced in her family growing up. For her, overcoming the world would include dealing with the trauma of realizing that people who should have been caring for her as a little girl were abusing her, were, were neglecting her. And she'd been through counseling, sought all kinds of help and support. And she joined a group for women who were sharing their struggle and their journey and seeking the Lord's guidance on how to move forward in their lives and stories. And she had this special encounter with God. She sent me an email about it. That's why I want to share pieces of it with you. So she sent me an email about what she was hearing God say to her on this journey with these other women to try to put the brokenness into perspective of God's plan in her life. I'm not going to use her real name, obviously, but here's what she wrote to me. This is what she kind of heard God speaking into her life. Could it be, Brenda, that instead of you believing that you can make them pay for the abuse by keeping it fresh in your mind and holding on to it so tightly that you could choose to turn it over to me? Allow me to deal with them as I choose, and your part is to let go and agree with me. Let me choose to show them mercy, or let me choose to show them justice. And later in the email, she expressed, I can't begin to express the grandeur of what this means to me. I've read and reread this message in my mind, and I can't go without tears of joy and gratitude and praise. It's definitely more than I could even think to ask. It wasn't only a change in my view of forgiveness, but also a beautiful understanding that God is meeting me right where I am without condemnation for my stuckness, my slowness, or my shallowness of journey. She was saying she encountered the victory that was already hers. She still has a journey, but now she's on that journey as one who knows God's love and as a child of God can walk through that. Faith is about experiencing victory and power and peace that's already yours in Christ. Faith changes you, it frees you, it empowers you, it sustains you. So where in your life today do you need to stop striving? Where in your life today do you need to kind of let down the self-protection barriers? Where do you need today to know you're a child of God? Think about that area of your life. Picture it in your mind. Wound, conflict, addiction, broken relationship, setbacks in your life, fear, worry, shame. Now over that, over that mental image that you have in your mind, I want you to place the cross, an image of the cross, and the victory that Jesus accomplished for you on the cross, and the position that you have as a child of the living God. And then live your life today and in the days to come, not in response to this world, but in full faith of the one who's conquered this world and who made a way for you to live as a child of God. Father, thank you so much for story. Thank you for your story that includes us as your children. 
Forgive us for so often living as we don't have a father who loves us and who's already won the victory through Christ. I pray for every one of us as we're thinking about those challenges in our lives, those areas where we need to have victory. I pray that we would accept and lean into the hope that we have in Jesus Christ and the victory that has already been won for us. And that we will walk forth in these relationships and these challenges and in this brokenness as your children. In Christ's name.